I sent you the link. Mm -hmm. So this is not working, eh?
mean it's not okay. All right.
right. Um, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome back to this lecture series. Um, today we talk about the fundamentals of calculus because uh, it's important to understand some aspect of calculus when you are doing medical research. Um, we have missed uh, this series for the last two uh, weeks, uh, inevitably so. And um, I'm looking forward to bridge uh, the gap in terms of what you've not covered for the last two weeks. Um, what I'm going to do, I want to believe all of us are on board. Um, before you're there, you can see Kerubo. Ruth, Mongai, where are the BSc intercalated students? Yvonne, have you sent to the BSc intercalated students? The link, Hello. Let me see. Um, all right, fine. I started to join. Welcome, Sarah. Um, inform the other uh, the other classmates to join. We are starting now. Only matters fundamentals of calculus. Even if probably you never covered calculus in high school or anywhere else. I'm going to try and simplify it for you and show you the application uh, in as far as uh, medical research is concerned. It is not an area that uh, you find being taught in medical school so much, but I have the feeling it is because probably not many would want to venture into the mathematics or calculus. However, if you are to do some medical research, you need to understand some basics of calculus. Uh, and I want to introduce it like this, that in the last series of our lectures, we covered correlation and linear regression. And I say this, that when you are doing correlation and regression, we are dealing with variable, two variables by varied relationships that are of linear function, by varied relationships that are of linear function. And I introduce or I reminded you the concept of this algebra equation y is equal to mx plus c y is equal to mx plus c and when we plotted the graph of y versus x y being a variable and x being a variable and I say this that in this equation y is a dependent variable because it's depending on the changes in x when x changes, y changes with a certain fraction dictated by m, which is a gradient of the equation. I give an example of this equation. y is equal to 2x plus 2. Therefore, you can see y is 2x, 2 is our m. And this other two here is our C. And when we plotted, we saw that 
where when x when x is zero here, y is two because that is the y intercept. A c is the constant. Now the other thing is the gradient of this line. The gradient of this line, which is a, a straight line, is a, a linear line, a straight line, can be determined by change in y dy, change in y, divided by change corresponding change in x. So that if x changes from x1 to this point to this point, you say when x is 1, y is here, is y1. When x is 2, y is y2 here. So y2 minus y1, the same as y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. In essence, what we call the rice divided by the run. The rice divided by the run. It's rising from y1 to y2, that's the rice, as running from x1 to x2. Therefore, the rice change in y, y2 minus 1, divided by the run, x2 minus x1, this give a gradient which is m, which is 2 now in this case. So here it is changing, or well, this one is let's say uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, this is uh, probably 6 here and 4 here. So the 6 minus 4 is 2, 2 divided by 2 minus 1 is 1, you get 2. This is hypothetical situation. This is a hypothetical situation. And it's good if you get such kind of a relationship, it will be a perfect, ideal world. Ideal. And using this then, you can be able, using linear regression, you can be able to predict the value of y when x is so much you can easily predict because of a linear relationship. However, in real life, it's not usually hypothetical, it's not usually ideal, it's not perfect. It does not follow this linear relationship. Most often, it follows exponential relationships that are non-linear. And therefore, when you start thinking about nonlinear relationship, you find this y is equal to mx raised to power n. n can be from 2 upward plus c. And I give an example of y is equal to 2x power 2 plus 2. So what you get is not a linear, but a nonlinear, like a parabola a non-linear relationship. And therefore, if you are to think about the gradient of this line, the gradient is not constant like it would be in a linear function. At every given point, the gradient keep on changing. And therefore, you may not be able to point out two points like this one and use them to determine the rise and the run. You may not be able to use two point x1 and x2 to determine the gradient. Because the gradient keeps on changing at any given time. It's not constant. It keep on changing. So the rate of change of y given x is not constant. It keeps on changing and therefore it poses some challenge in determining the rate of change, the gradient at any given point. At the same time, if you determine the area under the curve, this area, A you see, area under the curve, 
unlike the area of the curve here would be easy to calculate because you know this up to here is a trapezoid in that shape. So there is a first rectangle up to here, then a triangle. And you know how to calculate the area of a rectangle is width times the length. Then you add the area of the triangle, half base times height. And because it's linear, you add this and this, the area of this rectangle plus the area of this triangle will give you the area of the curve. Easy. However, for a parabola like this one, where the value keep on changing here, you cannot use it. Uh, you cannot use a triangle to calculate this area because there is no triangle here to keep on changing. There are so many. Um, if you are changes along the gradient so that you may not be able to calculate the area of the curve. And the area of the curve is also important in research because um, if you are talking about the area of the curve is accumulation of whatever, accumulation of whatever you are looking for between time x1 and x2. And in real life then you find that Example like this one, when you talk about the rate of growth of an infection, think about a bacterial infection that you know at time zero, somebody has gotten infected with a bacteria or a virus, for example. After an hour, it will have grown to a certain amount, to a certain number of bacteria in the body. After two hours, because it's increasing in an exponential manner, you may not be able to predict using the linear regression model. After 24 hours, because of the exponential growth, at least power here, you may not be able to predict the way we did with the linear regression. You need something else, a new model, to model the rate of growth of an infection in this, one, in this case. So if you are dealing with research on the rate of growth of bacteria, rate of growth of virus, COVID-19 for example, from the time of infection to a certain time T, you can only model if you understand the concept of calculus. Think about tumor growth. You are doing a research of, on a no, novel drug that you have come up with. And do you know the initial volume of the mass of a tumor? And you are saying your drug is slowing the growth of the tumor. Therefore, you don't want to administer it, the drug, and after a certain period of time, compare with the controls, probably the one that didn't have drug, and see whether the volume of the tumor is decreasing or is comparable with the non-treatment group. And the tumor growth follows the exponential growth. Therefore, you may not be able to evaluate using the linear regression. You need the uh, concept of calculus to assess that. When you talk about drug optimization, you want to establish the same doses because you know the drug is two-edged there is a good effect and there is a side effect. And as you increase the dosage, you get to a point where you get the optimal dose that has no side effect or the least side effect. But when you start increasing further, the side effects start accumulating. And therefore, you need to establish at what point the maximum where you get the maximum benefit with minimum side effect. That become another parabola 
Therefore, you need to address the concept of calculus in order to establish the maximum. So, drug optimization studies, you require the concept to address the concept of calculus. When you're dealing with a nonlinear function like this, you need basics of calculus in order to establish these parameters. So, this one you require a understanding of algebra. This is an algebra equation. This you understand the, you need to understand the calculus. Algebra calculus. This is an algebra equation, this is a calculus equation. Therefore, I'm not going to go back to algebra because we've covered this. I want now to deal with nonlinear function and studying the fundamentals of calculus in doing this work. So for today, um, I'll first of all do take you through um, the basics, the fundamentals of calculus. Then probably I'll take another one hour, another day, to talk about the application, to use that understanding to solve uh, medical research question using the concept of calculus. So, when I start talking about calculus, I talk about the rate of change and the area under the curve. The rate of change and the area under the curve. Those two uh, are important. The rate of change. The rate of change is a piece the area of the curve. I think it's also important to know the history of uh, calculus so that you appreciate where you're coming from. Uh, during the, the years that were being called the knowledge revolution, years by Greeks, around 500 before Christ, 500 years before Christ, there was a revolution. Um, Remember the days of uh, Aristotle, the days of Plato, is described as the era of scientific illumination. And quite a lot was done by the philosophers and uh, mathematicians of those days. And they were interested in calculating the areas of different shapes. 
And they were able to, this is the history of calculus. Around 500 BC, some mathematicians were able to come up with a formula of calculating the area of a triangle. This is a base and this is a height. And they say the area here is half times base times height. And this brought a lot of light into the science of shapes. What we came to call trigonom trigonometry, geometry and trigonometry. Such that whenever they could get something with a farad shape like that, a polygon, polygon, they would easily calculate the area of this polygon by dividing it into triangles. They put the center there. Then they would say those are triangles and this is a base and they would draw the height. Then they say this triangle number one multiplied by one, two, three, four, five, six, even a hexagon and they get the area of that shape. So understanding how to calculate the area of a triangle brought an illumination into understanding how to calculate the area of any shape. However, in the days of Archimedes, there was a concern that they wanted to calculate the area of a circle. And they realized that if you do a triangle, you may leave all this part without being accounted before, all this part, all this part. So what they do? They view the same but now the rectangle and the steel it could not account for this therefore they went ahead drew various shapes of polygons and they realize as you continue drawing the shapes of a polygon and therefore easy to calculate the area of a polygon because you could cut it in terms of triangles. The more the polygon shapes, the better the estimation of the area of a circle. Because you reduce this area that's unaccounted for to an extent that the area is very negligible. So the more the polygonal shape, as the, the number of polygon approaches infinity, it's infinity, then you are able to say that you, are a, you have a definite area of a circle as n approaches infinity. And this is the number of the sides of a polygon. As it increases toward infinity, and you are able still to measure the base of a triangle and the height is established, you can almost with certainty say that you are able to measure the area of a circle. Of course, with an error that is negligible. And this concept 
of n approaching infinity is the start of a big subject in calculus. We call it the limit. n approaches infinity or n approaches n number that you want. The limit you want. And I'll talk about the limit in a short while. So this was the beginning of understanding trying to come up with method of determining an area of a circle. But around 17th century, now is after Christ, Isaac Newton, a great scientist and a philosopher, encountered a problem. I'm still going back to the history. To be precise, Isaac Newton was born in 1607, birthday 1607, or that 1667, and during his life as a philosopher, during his life as a philosopher, the a story goes like this that he observed an apple falling down from an apple tree, seated there. He observed an apple falling down, and this apple, as it fell, he noticed that it was not falling at, at the same speed or the rate of four. Incidentally, it accelerated towards the ground. Therefore, otherwise, or the velocity was not constant, but varied with the position, and position also is a factor of time. As it fell to the ground, it was falling at an increasing speed. So it is slower here and very fast down here. So the question was, was it therefore possible to know the speed at any given position? Based on the mathematics of the time, it was not possible. It had not been thought out about how to determine the acceleration at any given position here, which is in respect to time. So that concerned him a lot and he had to think through on how to overcome this problem. At the same time, remember this was an European. in Europe. At the same time, another gentleman, this is Isaac Newton, Gottfried Leibniz, almost the same time with this guy, 1646, and died in uh, what? 1716 in Germany. Had an issue with 
calculating an area of a never changing polygon. Calculating the area at the curve. And once they thought through of how to go about it, which I'll take you through what he did, they concurred both of them that it's possible to determine the rate of change and the area of the curve. And remember, if you get to know this, the change, the rate of change of the gradient of this line is the same as the acceleration, the gradient. And these are the guys working towards the area of the curve. So these two are thought out to be the co-inventor, co-inventor of calculus. Co-inventor of calculus. That's as far as history is concerned. Now let's come to calculus. What is calculus? They have a branch of mathematics of mathematics according to the simplest way you can talk about branch of mathematics. That deals with instantaneous, an important word, instant, instantaneous rate of change. And accumulation. Accumulation, what we call area at the curve, for nonlinear functions. Calculus, we divided it into two. Differential and integral. Differential calculus concern with instantaneous. rate of change integral deals with accumulation with time with respect to time area at the curve. In a graph that is non-linear.
I'll start with differential calculus, then I'll talk about the integral calculus shortly. Instantaneous rate of change. Instantaneous rate of change. Remember um, when we say y is equal to mx plus c in this algebra equation, this is dependent variable. This is E dependent variable. Dependent variable. That means the value of y is depending on the value of x. When x changes, y changes. x is E dependent, y is dependent on x. And because of that, y therefore y is a function of x. That is very important. y is a function of x. And we say y is a function of x. Therefore, y is equal to function x. I'll be using this concept. y is a function of x. And remember, therefore, when we have y is equal to mx plus c and we have a straight line this is y this is x when you have a straight line a linear line if we want to determine the gradient of this line you just pick two points, call it x1 and this call it x2 and you say this at x1 y is y1 at x2 y is y2 because we are determining the gradient of that line and therefore gradient which is equal to the rate of change of this line is equal to the rise over land change in y over change in x which is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And since this is this line is fx function of x, 
Therefore, you are able to determine the gradient of fx. That way, the rate of change. Remember, we are talking about differential calculus. Instantaneous rate of change. Change in y my, uh, divided by change in x. And this is a straight line, so everywhere is the same. So you can pick x2 and x1 and do this. Calculate the gradient, the rate of change of a straight line. And you only pick x1 and x2 to give you y1 and y2 because these are dependent on this. And you are done because this simple is linear straight line. The problem comes when it is not a linear line, it is a non-linear line. Why? Because of this. Here's the reason. Now we are getting into the real calculus. Pay attention. This is x, this is y, and this line looks like that. So, at no given place you find gradient is the same. Gradient will keep varying from one point to another. And therefore, the instant position, you would want to establish the position at x1, Let's assume you want the gradient at this point x. This point x and you want to know its gradient. Its gradient can only be determined by determining a line a line that touches that point only. And this line is called tangent line. A line that is tangent. The tangent line. A line that touches that particular point and nowhere else. Then you calculate. is gradient, then you will be able to know the rate of change of that line at point x. However, for you to know the gradient from the perspective of the linear equation, you need to have two points. So, if you have to have two points then, what you need to do is to draw a line with another point here. You pick any point. And you draw a line that passes through the two points. You draw a line that passes the two points, and this is called a secant line. Second line, secant line. A line that touches two points. And take it, it's a straight line. Then you see this. This second line touches it at this second x. This second x, you say, assume the distance from x, this x to the second x, assume the distance is h, call it h. Therefore, this is x plus h position. Follow me closely. This is x. 
this is x plus h. Therefore, when we have x here, then what is y at the point of x? y is dependent of x. Remember, since y is dependent of x, y is equal to function of x. Therefore, we can say our y is a function of x. It's f x. In the same manner, when x is x plus h, what is our y? Our y is going to be function of x plus h. We replace x with x plus h. Very well. And therefore, what is the gradient of this line we have drawn here? The gradient of this line, which is the rate of change, is equal to the lines over the run, which is equal to change in y over change in x. Change in y over change in x, which is function x plus h minus function x defined by x plus h minus x x plus h minus x x cancels x x cancels x and you are left with function x plus h minus function x over h I hope you are together up there not write in a manner that you would get confused. This is H. This is my H. H. And this is the slope of this line. Second line. The slope of the second line. Remember, when we do that, we, we introduce a second point so as to calculate the gradient of the line. But our interest of the gradient at this particular point. Therefore, what we need to do next is to think of how we can reduce our h, our h, bring it toward x towards x to a point that is almost zero to a point that is almost zero when we bring our h to almost zero if it is equal to zero it will be x but if it is equal to zero then we cannot be able to calculate the gradient because to calculate the gradient you need two points and therefore we can only say we bring our h to almost zero, towards zero, so that it be x, but it cannot be completely zero. It might be 0 0.00001, as long as it's a distance you can measure. And therefore, with this equation, with a gradient of the line, the next thing we'll add there is that we put a limit of h toward zero. We put a limit of h toward zero on the f x plus h minus f x over h. 
When you do this, we put a limit of h towards zero. Then what we have done, we have established f prime x. This is what we call f prime, f to the power one, f prime x. And f prime x is called the derivative. Derivative. This derivative is actually the differential calculus and the interstitial rate of change for point x. Because you have put a limit towards zero. Remember the story of the circle. The story of the circle. I gave. To calculate the area of a circle, you need polygons that are toward infinity. You are reducing them towards infinity, towards zero. And if you do that, then you can say with very minimal error that you have approximated the area of the circle. In the same manner, if you reduce our h to a zero, you are almost getting to x. And you can approximate the instantaneous gradient at that point. And remember what I said? The rate of change of something like the rate of growth of a bacteria colony. You can only pick them at specific time t, assume this x was time. So using this concept, you can say at time two hours, time three hours, you can actually determine the rate of growth of a bacteria colony. You can also calculate the rate of growth of a tumor by measuring volume of a tumor versus time. But in a given time t, the rate of growth is different from t2 or t3 and can be determined by this method of derivation, derivatives, and that is differential calculus. Then I'll pick this and I'll apply to an equation of I so that you probably get a better understanding. I repeat this because this now is a formula of how to calculate instantaneous rate of change in a nonlinear graph and I give you a function x, the function of a line, then you'll be able to calculate the instantaneous rate of change for a particular x given a particular x. So now you know what's a derivative. Derivative. How do you use derivatives? I think we are given y. y is equal to 3x squared plus 12. Assume it is such an equation. Can you be able to calculate the derivative of this?
This is the same as saying fx, the function of x, since I said y is a function of x, is equal to 3x squared plus 12. Alright, remember we have seen the derivative which is y prime, uh, function prime is equal to what? The limit, the limit of h towards 0. Function x plus h minus fx. Divide by h. We have established that from our der der derivation. We have derived that. And therefore, what you need to do is to come and insert your x. your function and this one this is a function x is like this so you will say limit h towards zero into a function of the function of x the function of x is 3x squared our function of x whatever x is we put x plus h here plus 12 x plus h, I hope you understand where it comes from. Plus 12. Minus 3x squared plus 12. Our x is 3x squared plus 12. Our fx. Our fx is 3x squared plus 12. Whether there is x, our fx plus h, x plus h, and this is squared plus 12 over h. I want it to sink there. Remember, we have established this equation, fx, f, x plus h minus fx divided by h. Our fx is 3x plus 12, 3x plus 12. This is fx. Therefore, our fx plus h is where there is x, is x, you add h, and then you square it, and it's like that. Then, uh, Where x plus h has come from. Okay. Allow me to repeat this. Huh? Calculating 
derivative why do we cancel out the x in the bottom and leave the one at the top allow me to go back to it quickly follow me this is important x y axis x axis y axis I drew a summary like this and I said assume at this point at that point you want to establish the gradient at that point and because it's not a straight line the gradient here is different from the gradient here is different from the gradient here it goes changing every point has its own gradient that must, about, must be understood because this is non-linear right and the gradient what is it it is a rate the instant this instant instant what is the rate of change assuming we are talking about the growth of a, a bacterial colony this amount of bacteria and this is the time for example and at time x at time call it x you want to know the rate of growth the rate of change the gradient and since it's not a straight line i started by saying you can only draw a tangent line and the tangent line is a line that touches the point of interest like that only tangent line a tangent line is a line that touches the point of interest and if you are able to determine the gradient of this line by doing something like that you can know the gradient there but it's not possible because this line can be drawn like that you can do it like this you can do it like this the way you want so it's not advisable to use tangent line it's advisable that you use a secant line second line called secant line and how do you draw that here's how we do it we still maintain our point there and we call it x that position call it x 1 2 3 4 5 can be position over 5 but just call it x for the sake of explaining explain it then you come along the same line you just pick a position I just pick there and connect connect the two dots like this when I connect the two points this line that is straight is called secant line I can be able to calculate or to determine the gradient of the secant line which will be the gradient of equal to the gradient of that line but you know it's not equal because I've taken two points that are far away from the other whereas I want the gradient at this particular uh, point therefore how do we determine that I'll come and drop here and say x has changed from this with a factor of let's say two units so if this was five and this is two units this would be seven so I said for the sake of deducing the derivative let's assume that the distance is called h h can be two units so that you add x this point will be x plus h what i mean is if our x was five for example and h is two units this will be five plus two so it will be x plus h that's where it comes from i'm trying to come up with an equation that will suffice any other situation we get into any other equation. Is it clear up to there, Edna?
where x no that is the root where x plus h has come from larger numbers. Okay. This point is so important you must understand. I obey what you want, what you say. I write large numbers. X and this is Y. You have something like that. A line like that. And you have a point here. You are calling it X. And you want to determine the gradient or the rate of change. The gradient is the same as the rate of change of that line at that point in time, at that instant. You can only draw a tangent line, but if you draw a tangent line, it's not the best because with only one point, the line can be at a very steep tangent, at a low tangent, at a negative tangent, so it's not the best. You need to come and pick up a second point. And this second point will be if from x to this point is a distance of h. h, just a distance in, you descend the h, so that this will be x plus h. And I've said, assume this was 5, assume this was 5, from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, then h are 2 units, so x plus h will be 5 plus 2, it will be 7. But I'm afraid to use these numbers because this is a general idea I'm developing. So that this would be x plus h at this point. And I would come and draw a line that touches the two dots like this. And this line, if I have to find this is called secant line, touches two two dots, secant line. If I'm able to determine the gradient of this line by change in y over change in x, in x, if I do the gradient of the secant line of the secant line, the gradient of the secant line can be the rise over the line, which is change in y over change in x. And change in y, then I need to know what is the y here. The y in respect to x, remember I said the y is a function of x. So that when you say y is equal to mx plus c, we are saying y can also be called a function of x is equal to mx plus c, the same. So this is fx. And the second one will be fx plus h, because it's x plus h. It's a function of x plus h. Therefore, Change in y is f x plus h minus f x over x plus h minus minus x. x plus h minus x. Function of x plus h minus function of x. Function of x plus h minus function of x. It is this minus this. So you get the rise. 
And around here, it is x plus h minus x. And I've said if x plus h minus x, then it therefore means you can x and minus x will cancel one another. Simple as that. Because x minus x, of course, is zero. You are left with the h. And when you left with the h, the final equation therefore becomes f x plus h minus f x over h. It's straightforward. There. And therefore the gradient of this secant line is this equation. Can be calculated from this equation. Function of x plus h minus function of x divided by h. Are we together? I want to know whether you are together up to there. You can calculate the gradient of this line based on the rise. This function of x plus h minus function x. You divide by x plus h minus x and x plus h minus x, x and minus x goes square zero, you are to the h. Explain again how just how x plus h is coming from y b. Let me explain again. In this line that is not a linear line, this is a non-linear line. At that point, let us designate this point to be x. Let us designate this point to be x. Such that if we move towards increasing side and we increase it with a factor of h, h can be any letter. Could have x increase with a, let's increase with two unit, let's increase with j or whatever, but we have chosen, let's increase it with h. There are this point where we have a second point here. The x will be x plus h. It should be x plus h. In the same manner then, because y is a function of x, y is a function of x, and therefore y can be written as fx, when we have x, this one will be y. When we have x plus h, it will be function of x plus h. Let me know whether you have to go up there. That's good, very good. So now you have been able to relate y with x because y is a function of x. So if this is x, this is fx. If this is x plus h, this is function of x plus h. So, calculate the gradient of the secant line is the rise change in change in y over change in x. Change in y is function x plus h minus function x. Change in y, uh, x is x plus h minus x, x plus h minus x, x cancels minus x because if you do x minus x is zero, you are to the h, that is h. And this is the gradient of the second line. However, I have said this, this cannot explain completely the gradient at this point because we want the gradient at point x. The gradient at point x, for it is function x. But now we have calculated the gradient between here and here, this line, second line. Second line. So we need to bring it towards x such that it should be almost on top of x so that we see the rate of change at point x. Therefore, if our h start coming to add x so that h is almost approaching zero, we'll be able to say that we are determining the gradient 
instant gradient on x. And that's the whole fundamentals of differential calculus. Instantaneous rate of change everywhere around the curve. So we bring our h towards zero. We reduce this one towards zero so that it's so near x such that the error is almost zero, negligible, and therefore we can say we are able to calculate instantaneous gradient rate of change on x. Therefore, with this equation, therefore, we only come and say limit. We want to limit our h, put it towards zero on this equation of fx plus h minus fx divided by h, where h is now towards zero, coming almost here. And therefore, when we do that, then we can determine not the gradient, not the gradient of the second line, but we can confidently say that we are determining the instantaneous gradient or the rate of change on x. And therefore, it is no longer going to be fx, we call it f prime x. And this f prime x is a derivative. We call it a derivative. Because we have put a limit to it. We have put a limit to it. It's a derivative of fx, and therefore it's prime f prime x. And that is the general equation. The general equation of a, of a differential calculus. Differential calculus. Yes, yes, look. Establish the differential calculus, the equation for derivative. This one. That's our limit as h approaches zero. But now I want uh, to to apply it so that it will help you to move forward and see how we are going to apply this equation into a line that has got a function. Okay.
this is um, an equation of a line. It's a function of a line. When you see y is equal to 3x plus 12, remember this is a fx. Always. This is a fx. It's a function. Y is a function of x. It's a fx. But I want you to calculate the f prime x. f1x as the derivative of this equation. And I'll show you why it's important to understand this concept. Now from there it will become a bit easier for all of us. Remember f prime x we have seen is a limit of h towards 0 f x plus h minus f x over h yes that is the equation and therefore f prime x in this case is a limit h towards 0 Our fx is this one. Our fx is this one. So fx plus h is whatever there is an x, you add h so that you get this. So it is going to be our fx is going to be 3 into bracket x plus h and it is a square squared plus 12 minus 3x squared plus 12 divided by h. Simple as that. I hope you have understood why x plus h. From this equation, x plus h. Whatever there is x in fx plus h, you add x plus h, then you do x is here. Square. Therefore, the next will be x squared limit h is equal to 2 r 0. x squared three. you remember is uh, x plus h, x plus h plus 12 minus 3x squared plus 12 over h. If you can remember how to open brackets, you know how to open bracket, it is 3 to be a bracket x times x is x squared, x times this is xh, this is again plus xh plus h squared plus 12 minus 3x squared plus 12 again we open the bracket this is 2 2xh these are 2xh 2xh this one so it can it will going to be open the bracket so it will be 3x squared plus 3 times 2xh that is 6xh plus 3h squared plus Remember, there was a bracket there because this is a function x minus function x. So minus function x. So, there was a bracket there. It's within a bracket. So that is minus plus 12 minus 3x squared minus 12. Here is uh, 3x 
squared minus 3x squared to so go. What else? Plus 12 minus 12. So what are you left with? Is 3h squared. Oh, not 3. It's uh, 6. 6xh plus 3h squared over h. And we'll get all of them over h. And all of them, there is a h that we are dividing with. When you have this, it, remember you always remove, take 3 from outside to bracket 2xh plus h squared over h. Because of the H. But uh, they are fine, I don't know you got on it, right? <coughs> Good, um, calculate the derivative. Of this function, of this equation. I've taken you through this long process 
of calculating derivatives of a function like this y is equal to 3x squared plus 12 for you to appreciate to appreciate when you turn out talking about the shortcuts because I will give you a shortcut on how to calculate the derivative of such an equation I will give you a method that is a shortcut that you may not use all this it's a shortcut of calculating the derivative of this. It's called power rule. The power rule of calculating the derivative of a function. And the function is an equation. Is equal to y is equal to 3, x squared plus 12, for example. There's a rule that we use called the power rule that will end up giving you the same answer in a shortcut manner, in a very simple way. But you need to understand where it came from in the first instant. So this is the right method of determining a derivative. And a derivative, remember, is the rate of change at an instant. Instantaneous rate of change. I gave an example of uh, you want to optimize a drug that you have developed. You are seeing this drug is very really good in uh, clearing HIV, for example. It's a protease inhibitor. And you've come with yours and you, are, uh, you have a plausible explanation at the mode of action that is going to block replication of a virus, for example. It's an anti-COVID uh, drug. And this drug that you are uh, touting to be a potent anti-COVID drug 2020, you want to show really that is working. So you have to have a treatment group of infected uh, persons, a control group, and probably a standard group using a standard drug that you are using, like this of you, for example. So that then you know you start a dose at time zero and you are monitoring the viral load vis-a-vis -vis time. And you know the viral replication does not follow linear relations. It is exponential relations with certain powers. And then you say the model of your equation is the number the viral load, which is n, which is your y, is given by this, but t, in this case, is t, is time. x becomes time factor. So that the viral load, n, is a function of t, time. And you model your equation to be like this. Therefore, you need to come up with a derivative of this model, so that at any given time, when x is the time, you can say at t1, t2, where 2 can be an hour, 2 hours, 3 hours, you can determine the rate of progression of the virus, the rate of replication. And you can tell the rate of replication is decreasing or it is increasing at a decreasing rate or is actually decreasing compared to the standard and the control because it does not follow linear function it follows exponential function it's a non-linear equation so you need differential calculus first of all to establish the derivative of that equation which will be now 6x in this case and whenever you want to establish the rate of replication of that virus, you only come to 6, you insert your t. And you can confidently say this is the expected rate of replication at this specific time. All right? So you can use that model now to gauge whether your drug is working to reduce replication 
or it's just like a placebo or it can be compared with the existing drug in the market. So the importance of differential calculus determine the rate of progression. The rate instantaneous rate at any given point you can determine the rate so the derivative of this function is 6x I want you to see this I write something called here uh, Bear with me. Uh, there, I write power rule. Power rule. If you have an equation y is equal to x raised to power n, remember this is a function of x. And you want the gradient, which is the derivative of y prime x which is the same as change in y over change in x. Alright. It will be given by n n multiply this n multiplied by x you raise it to power n minus 1 that is what we call power rule to avoid all these calculations we use what we call the power rule to avoid all these calculations to make your work easier and we apply the power rule that if your function y is equal to x raised to power n then the derivative which is a gradient of the secant line which is also the instantaneous rate of growth instantaneous change change in y over change in x we bring n in front here multiply by x then you leave it with n minus 1 this rule applies in all power except except when n is minus 1 except when n is minus 1 because it can be minus 1 if it's minus 1 it doesn't apply I'll show you why. The power rule. I repeat. In order to avoid all the headache here, which was important for you as master student and researchers in uh, med medical field, you need to understand the background <coughs> and the application of differential calculus. However, to simplify your work, when you are given the function or the model of the equation, then you can use 
the power rule x to power n if y is equal to x power n then the derivative which is a gradient which is the rate of change will be you bring n in front of x multiply by x then you the power will be n now minus 1 therefore using the power rule using the power rule f derivative of this x therefore is going to be this power you bring it to 2 multiply by 3x then 2 minus 1 plus whenever you see a constant like 12 whenever you see a constant like 12 there is usually an x raised to power 0 that we do not like because anything that is raised to power 0 is 1 if you raise any number to power 0 it is 1 so x to power 0 here is 1 and therefore if you use the same power rule you bring 0 plus 0 multiply by 12 of x plus 0 and all this anything multiplied by 0 is 0 isn't it therefore ignore whenever you see a constant know there is an x raised to power 0 but we don't write it and anything raised to power 0 is 1 therefore we don't write it and whenever you differentiate it it will still give you 0 so it's not important to know that to write that and therefore your equation here will be 2 times 3 x is 6 x raised to power 2 minus 1 raised to power 1 so it is 6 x therefore this 6 x is the same answer 6 x therefore this power rule help us it's, it's an established rule help us take a shortcut from all this work and be able to derive to determine a derivative of a function like this with ease therefore we use power rule like that I will give you another equation, but we will use the power rule instead of this long process. Differential calculus. Why is equal to x to power four plus two x to power three? plus x squared plus 4x plus 8 
determine the rate of change when x is equal to 3. I want you to start visualizing uh, again, I'm talking about the rate of growth of a tumor or the rate of growth of a bacteria or the, the drug optimization, uh, the dose you give is a physical excretion of the drug at time, three hours, x being time, three hours. What will be the rate of change at that point? Given that the function, which is our function, which is why is modeled against that equation using power. Loop. Don't go to the other process, the long process. Use the power. Loop. Remember the power we have said. If function of x is equal to x to power one to power n. The derivative of x is going to be n times x n minus 1. That's the power rule. Therefore, the derivative of x, which is give the rate of change, in this case, is going to be you bring x to this side should be 4 times x then 4 minus 1 n minus 1 is 3 because it's 4 minus 1 is 3 plus 3 times 2 is 6 x n minus 1 is 3 minus 1 squared plus you bring 2 here is 2 x minus 1. Plus 1 here is 4x. When you say 4x, but here is 1 minus 1, which is 0. Anything raised to power 0 is 1. So, you just remain with 4. What about 8? 8 had been raised to power 0, because it's power 1. To power 0. So, therefore, it would have been 0 multiplied by 8 times x, 0 minus 1, and all this factor is 0. Therefore, I don't have right to write it there. So, our derivative of this equation is this. We do it very quickly, and therefore, we will say our rate of change at x is equal to 3. Therefore, our function at 3, we substitute x with 3. Is going to be 4 multiplied by 3 cubed plus 6 6 multiplied by 3 squared plus 2 multiplied by 3 plus 4. 4 times 3 times 3 times 3, 27 plus 6 times 9 plus 2 times 3 is 6 2 times 3 is 6 plus 4 so 27 times 4 you can calculate that One oh eight plus six times nine fifty four plus six plus four. What is the answer? Six eighty two. Six Sorry. no no. One oh eight one seventy two. 
Therefore, you see your derivative at 3, x is 3 is 172. What does it mean? It means that the rate of change when x is 3, the instantaneous rate of change when x is 3 is 172 times. 172 times. Meaning that if you are studying the growth rate, the specific growth rate of a tumor whose model of increasing mass is this, you definitely say at t time is three days, if it's in x is in terms of days, is three days. The tumor that was initially growing at a very slow rate will be growing specifically at the rate of 172 times. The original rate. I hope you make sense. The importance of differential calculus in determining rates of growth, instantaneous rate. This is what we call fast derivative. Fast derivative. Where you put one or like a prime. This is the fast derivative. And the fast derivative gives us the rate of change. It's important to understand that one. The first derivative, we only derive it for the first time. Because it's even like this, we can also again derive it the second time. And if we do the second time, we would say second derivative function of x. Alright? And we would still go doing the same. But the reason we would do second derivative is when we are doing standards to determine the maximum or the minimum in a curve. Maximum and the minimum. But first of all, before we go there, we understand the rate of change with the first derivative. Because you cannot start at a certain the second derivative if the first derivative is not understood. Therefore, it's important that you understand how to determine the first derivative that represents the gradient of a second line as it approaches limit towards zero. Therefore, it is giving you instantaneous rate of change. Instantaneous rate of change at a particular point in time.
Are you comfortable with this? I want to give you uh, I want to give you a quick assignment, a problem to solve quickly. To see that you have understood how to do that.
All right. Um, yes, we are moving on well. Okay, um, let's answer this. We are given the, the model equation of how the virus is multiplying. And the model equation is y is equal to 3x plus 2x plus 20. I want you first of all to note that at this point in time when time x is 0, at the initial stage of the infection, when the time is almost zero, a uh, person has 20 particles that started to multiply. And we're asking at the fourth hour, at the fourth hour here, what will be the rate? of change. Of course there will be the amount that you can put this equation and say at T0 is 20 at this point is how many? At 4 hours you put 4 and you add you can get the Y2 here. But you are interested in the rate the rate of growth at that point in time. The rate of growth will be given because it's a FX line fx line which is 3x cubed plus 2x squared plus 20 the rate of growth here is change in y over change in x which is our f prime our derivative and our derivative we use a power rule <coughs> the power rule will be 3 multiplied by 3 which is 9 x 3 minus 1 is 2 plus 2 times 2 is 4 2 minus 1 is 1 and if we go to this this is x has got an x times 0 then 0 bring here so you ignore 20 it's a constant you ignore it so our derivative is this and our derivative is the rate of growth rate of change instantaneous at that instant any instant here this will be the rate of change we come in and then we fix our t and i said x is time is our t is four hours times four squared plus four times four 9 times 16 plus 4 times 4 this comes to 144 plus 16 and the answer is 160 I've seen 160 for the number of you that's the correct answer what does it mean What does it mean? It means Kerubo doesn't know what to do with 20. Remember I said this, in an equation like this one, 20 is always the next day raised to power 0. We, it's only that we don't like this. And I say, remember, anything raised to power 0 is 1. So whenever you see a constant like 20 kerubo, a constant like 20, always add x raised to power 0. It is there. It's only that we don't mention it. Because anything raised to power 0, x raised to power 0 is 1. So it should be 20. So that when we now use our power rule, 
and we try to bring 0 in front of 20, you do 0 times 20, anything multiplied by 0 will be 0. So any constant when we differentiate will become 0. And therefore we don't like it when we are doing this. We don't like it. When we are differentiating, we don't like it. And therefore our differential, our derivative becomes 9x squared plus 4x. This one is cancelled because of the zero that you multiply by 20 is zero. Is it understood, Kerubo? Understood. So anything, anytime you see a constant in an equation like this, 3x, 3x power 3, 2x power 2, 20, this 20 I've said again, I repeat, has got an x raised to power zero. It's only that we don't like that. Therefore, when we start differentiating it, the zero will come and prime by the what? constant, it will be zero. So when we're differentiating, we lose it. So what does one sixth mean? It means that at four hours, if this model of replication holds true, at the fourth hour, the virus will be replicating at a rate of 100 times the initial number. So I think quite a number of you have gotten it correct. So it means you have understood it. You have understood the concept. And that is differential calculus. And its application in medicine. I expect that... Uh, after this, you go and um, at least around the area of application of calculus in uh, medical research. It will make more sense now uh, why we, we are concerned that you should understand differential calculus. Differential calculus. Now, it's already 11, 11, it's past 11, and um, I thought I would I'll probably finish with the differential, calculus, and talk about integral calculus. However, Allow me uh, 15 minutes. Let me know whether you can allow me 15 minutes. I see something else about the maximum and minimum. Yvonne, is it okay? Okay. If it is you are doing a study of uh, the normal growth pattern of a, a bacterial colony, you remember from high school days that there is what you call the lag phase. The lag phase. Then there is the local phase. Then there is a plateau, and there is decline phase.
protophase decline decline phase and the explanation was from the time of inoculation because of the fewer number of uh, uh, the pathogen, the bacteria in this case, the rate of growth is slow, it's lagging behind. Then you get to a point where you have got a critical mass, critical mass that start to multiply very fast exponential growth, the rock phase. Then you get to a point where the rate at which they are dying and the rate at which they are multiplying almost zeros one another. You get a plateau, the rate of growth is zero. And then you get a decline phase because of accumulation of toxins, because uh, again, probably the nutrition is not good. You get a decline. It's a natural growth curve of bacteria. If if you had such a curve, is a parabola, a parabola, a parabola, because it has a gradient that is positive. It has a zero gradient and a gradient that is negative.
All right, um, um, allow me again. Uh, um, So, uh, verdict. From during the log phase and the log phase, this is why this is X. During the log office, the derivative of change in y over change in x, which is a function of x and is a prime, is going to be a positive answer. A positive answer. At this point, f prime x, the derivative, at the plateau stage is going to be equal to zero because y is not changing even if x is changing. <coughs> y is not changing even if x is changing. So at the plateau stage, the fx prime there is going to be equal to zero. At the decline phase, the f prime x, the derivative of x, is going to be a negative answer. At this point, where you change from <coughs> a positive to a negative answer, first derivative and this is called second derivative. I don't want to mix you up. This plateau phase is the maximum of that function, of that equation. It's a maximum. From there, it can only go down. Maximum. I think. Um, what I will do, because uh, I, I have I realized that going into the details of maximum and minimum take, might take another probably an hour. I don't want to do that. Uh, allow me not to go into this, um, but remember the concept of uh, maximum dose. Maximum dose. Where you are giving a drug then go to a maximum before it start going wearing out. Is it possible using calculus to determine the dose and the time at which you will get the maximum dose in the body? Optimization of drug. At the same time, if you reverse this and you get the one that look like this. <coughs> The minimum, minimum, minimum. And we have about the minimum inhibitory concentration. Mix. Minimum inhibitory concentrations. When you're talking about drugs. Inoculating. Um, uh, I'll find time to take you through how to determine the maxima and the minimas using differential calculus. Because it's important for you. But for now, allow me not to even try to go into it. But I'm preparing you that the next series of lecture that I will give, I will do the final bit of differential calculus, determining the maxima and the minima. And there is also something called the point of inflection. Inflection. When you are rising and when you get to this point, 
you stagnate, but then you start rising again. You find such a situation, you get this point, you stagnate, and then you start rising again. This point where you move from positive to zero to positive again is called the point of infraction. As you read aloud uh, calculus, you come across this concept. I'll discuss it with you next uh, lecture series so that you appreciate how we apply calculus in determining uh, dose of optimization. The, when you have a drug that you are testing and you are giving in increasing doses, at the same time the, the drug is being excreted, the mere administration, the drug is being administered, it's being <coughs> distributed in the body, it's being metabolized and it's being excreted. You may be able to determine the time at which a given dose will reach the maximum. At the same time, you may be able to tell me when you are doing a study on the effectiveness of antibiotic and you want to know the minimum inhibitory concentration, you still require calculus to start with that. And this I will cover the next series. So I would want you to, to have a look at differential regulars at your own time and then uh, I will finish with it next week and I'll talk about integral calculus. Integral calculus is easier. The area of the car, the accumulation of the amount. So far we've done uh, an introductory fundamentals of uh, calculus and uh, brought the concept of uh, limits the concept of limit as we limit our distance h towards you. You can reduce the error and you can increase the confidence of determining the instantaneous change of the rate of change at that instant. And uh, that has got so many applications in the medical research. So for now, uh, allow me to end there and I wish you a, a great week ahead. We'll meet next. Any question? Any question that you may have, you can raise it quickly or you can wish me uh, by my contact. All right.